Hey, welcome back to Driven Channel. And I'm here with a very special guest, you know, former uh, Navy SEAL. That's right. Right? Uh, Mighty Warrior. But your name is J Jimmy. That's that's your your handle, Mighty yeah. Warrior. Mighty Warrior 24. 24. Well, so so let, let's start right there. Like, I, I, I want to hear about your story, how... how how it's been because I, I know your life has been kind of crazy, right? It's been, it's been a- You've seen a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. It's next level crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, little, it's too crazy. It's been hard? It's been hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my every time I see my mom, I'm kind of sick and tired of it, but, but I love my mom to death, you know, but, and it's, but she's seen me go through so much. She saw my arrest. She saw my case get dropped when, when I was facing 15 years. She saw me all the struggles as a child with, with learning disabilities, ADHD. Yeah. And then she saw me walk across that grinder and become a SEAL, become my my dream job. Uh, she saw all the hardships along the way. Uh, so she's my my biggest support. And But yeah, it's uh, every time I see her, she's like, Jimmy, I'm just so glad you're not uh, How dead. old are you you're today? Dead. I'm 43. 43. Yeah. And and then the the Mighty Warrior 24, the, does a 24 have like a, like a special meaning or? Yeah, every single time I just say Mighty Warrior that year. So, you mm -hmm. know, and, I, and what I'm saying, man, is- oh, okay, got it. I'm not I'm not saying like, look, I'm a Mighty Warrior. I'm saying everybody out there is a Mighty Warrior. They got the Mighty Warrior spirit in mm -hmm. them, but it's it's up to them to start believing it yeah. and for that switch to go off in their head and say, you know what? All right, I'm going to start believing I'm a warrior out there. We need yeah. more. Yeah. So- in the in your childhood, how, how was your childhood, and and did you always want to become a Navy SEAL, or or were you just, or did it just happen when you grew up? And I, I know your childhood, you got into some troubles and things like that. Yeah, I was always Talk in trouble. About that. Yeah, I was always in trouble. But I remember I was at a Watson family reunion, you know, and uh, and everybody was like, the, one of my aunts said, you know, what do you want to be when you're when you grow up, Jimmy? And I was like, tiny, and uh, I said, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And they all like started laughing, and they're like, "Where you were you? a kid? Yeah, a tiny, yeah, like small kid." And and they were like, "Where did where did you get that from?" And I didn't know. I just said, "I want to be a Navy SEAL," but it was true. Now, of course, you know it shifts. You know, I want to be a a tank driver one day and a major in the army or colonel. But I, I definitely had that dream to become yeah. a Green Beret, a SEAL, something like that. You know? Yeah. When when you were facing uh, fifteen years in prison, was that before you became a Navy SEAL or after? That was after after the SEALs. Yeah. So, so, you, so what? So what happened? Right there? <laughs> well, crazy story. Um, I I retired out of the SEAL teams. Um, had a great career with the Marine Corps Combined Service, the Marine Corps Blackwater. Uh, what year was this when you when you retired? Uh, 2017. And so I get out of the the military. I I don't really have a grasp on what I'm going to do. Like a lot of veterans, they that transitions hard. Yeah. So um, I get a call from John McAfee himself. The um, Enigma antivirus guy. Yes, mogul antivirus tech billionaire. Um, through a connection, my buddy T Cav, he calls me up. He goes, Hey, you know this guy, John McAfee? I said, No, who's that? He goes, Check your computer, bro. You know, the McAfee antivirus. And I said, Oh, yeah. He said, Hey, he needs the best seal out there to go guard him. Of course, I was the best guy. It was just, you know, timing is everything in this life. And uh, I had just got out. And so John McAfee gave me a call on my cell phone and he said, you know who this is? And I said, um, I think it's John McPhee. He said, you know, how much do you charge? He got right down to brass tax. And I said, 500 to 1,000 a day, depending upon the threat. And he he said, well, I only pay my Green Berets 250 a day. And he spit out his scotch because that's all he ever drank. And I said, hey, sir, it's your life. It's your life. He, he drank said, a lot of scotch? Oh, he drank scotch all the time. Like every day? He never, I never saw him drink water. And I, I, I got scared. I said, one day I said, because I became like his right hand man, his yeah. assistant. And I was like, sir, I'm concerned about you. And he goes, why? And, and I said, because you never, I've never seen you drink water. And he said, there's water in scotch. Don't you know that? <laughs> and and I, I couldn't believe it. And he, I never saw him drink. I personally never saw him drink a, a glass of water. Yeah. But he drank, he did drink, he drank two bottles of scotch a day, single malt. Two so, bottles a day? Two bottles of scotch a day until, the Irish Mafia, Uncle Carl, told him that he needed to cut it in half. And so McAfee started to just smoke one pack of cigarettes a day and drink one bottle of scotch a day. But what kind of bottle are we talking about? Like, how big? What is it, Glenn Fittich? Glenn Fittich, you know, a, a regular size bottle. Is that like 1.75? Or, or what is that? Brandon, what, what's, what's, uh, 
What's the size of that it's, model? It's a full blown. So it's, a, it's like a, the, the it's normal a big one. one. Yeah. yeah. And he, he used one. to drink two of those a day? Two at least. Did he look healthy? He could. I mean, you know, he's got a very distinct voice. He looks like a sailor. And his, and, his, and, his, and his skin was tan, you know, from all the years out in the sun. How, how old was he? Uh, 75 years old. He was 75 years old when he was drinking that much. But it's interesting. When I became, when I became CEO, I started drinking like him, right? I kind of, you, you're a product of your environment. So I'm drinking every day scotch, smoking cigarettes, running his company. And I can remember at a party, he embarrassed me really bad because he came up and he said, hey, son, you know, when I started partying and he said this in front of everybody and I was like, I was still laughing drunk. I said, when, sir? He goes, when I became a success and he, and he called me out, he was basically saying, you don't have the right to drink. You don't have the right to party. So what he was saying was, you know, he never partied or anything until he was 40 years old right. until after the antivirus. That's when he went. So that's kind of how he could get away with going so hard with illicit drugs and scotch and, and Yeah, but 75, yeah. 75. <laughs> Is he still alive? No, he's not. He's not. They found him dead in a Spanish prison. They found him hung in a Spanish prison. After they arrested him, uh, the day he was supposed to be extradited back to the U.S. to stand trial um, with me, uh, he was found dead in his prison. And you then, think he uh, killed himself? You know, I just can't imagine John McPhee killing himself. Um, and I just talked about this with a friend today. I said, how, how, how did he kill? Why? You would never kill yourself if you found out you were getting transferred out of your prison, and even if it's to another prison, because it's something new. And McPhee loved the media coverage. He was a fighter and he was Irish. I, there's just no way he he killed himself in my eyes. Was he going to be released soon or, or, or no? Or was it? He was getting extradited, extradited from Spain to the U.S. and uh, to stand trial. Me and him were going to stand trial together. Of course, obviously, I think they wanted uh, McAfee primarily. But well, so he did he he fled to Spain? Is that what happened? And they caught him there or what? Yeah, happened? they caught him going through customs. I think he was trying to go to Turkey from Spain. This was when he knew he was in trouble already. Yeah. Yeah. You know, McAfee was uh, always three or four steps ahead of the game. And he could see right through people, read people. And so he was always playing this big game. And um, but this time he got caught in customs. So he was like a he was like a real like uh, like like he he really was like those people that you see on TV they make movies out of and like oh his whole life story was a movie. I mean he created the was he like a villain? You would say I think I think he embraced look if if you're gonna be the bad guy give people the give people the bad guy in his eyes if you want if you're gonna be people's saint. Be their saint, right? And so I think John McAfee was that to to John who, McAfee. Whoever they wanted him to be is what he kind of conformed into, kind of like a chameleon, you know. I want to look him up really quick. Not, John not. McAfee, a uh, you know, I think he sold. I think he sold McAfee. Oh yeah, he, he 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 has that look. Yeah, that's him, right? Yeah, that's him. Was he a big guy? Uh, six one, six one, maybe two twenty. Yeah, I, it's funny because I, I grew up, I was always techie. Like I, li I like computers. Yeah. And I remember that I used to get the, the Mac, Mac, is it McAfee? It's, it's McAfee it's, or how do, you, how do you pronounce it, it? It's not how it looks. McAfee. Mac, McAfee. Antivirus. McAfee antivirus? McAfee antivirus. Although so, it's, it looks like it's McPhee. Yeah. You know? So he, he became super wealthy with the antivirus. He became super well. Well, he sold he sold uh, McAfee antivirus to Intel for around seven hundred million dollars. Um, but he was a major proponent with. Uh, I think he was like best friends with Steve Jobs. He said Bill Gates was the most boring person in the world, but but he definitely created um, was a big proponent in iMessaging, creating iMessaging. Mm. He created the entire um, software system where the trains are, yeah. are on the 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 railway. Yeah, switching. Yeah. And until I think he got fired. See, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a big whiskey drinker, but I like champagne. You like champagne? Yeah, I like champagne. What kind and of champagne do you like? I, I like the Vouve Clicquot, the, oh, wow, the yellow. Have you had it? No, I haven't. So, so uh, you still drink? 
I, you know what? I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a big drinker anymore, but I'll, I'll have drinks, you know? Cause it makes me feel better that, you know, he used to drink two bottles. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so crazy. that makes me feel better. Like I, I don't, I don't drink that much. No, man. Yeah. But, but, uh, so, so was he like single and married? Was he with a bunch of 25 year old <laughs> hot, uh, models or what you, was would, you would think he would be in the Bahamas um partying with all these girls so when i went to do his executive protection when he first called me um i thought okay i'm gonna go to the uh, caribbean island or something and, and he was in lexington tennessee a podunk town out in the middle of nowhere in a big plantation like a state with these guard mm -hmm. dogs and he was married to um janice mcafee which was a self-proclaimed prostitute um that that actually um let me look her up that uh, yeah, you you might be surprised, and and so and Janice actually approached him in Miami, and Janice is cool. Janice was uh, she she's was she's she's still alive, right? She she's still alive, yeah, and she's pretty cool. I don't think this is the right one. Yeah, but but, but tell me tell me about her. She um <laughs> she um. Uh, she approached John McAfee. You see, if you approach John McAfee, he could never trust you. Mm -hmm. And so she walked up to him with this, uh, another one of her friends um, to, to John's table in Miami, right when he evaded um, Belize and he came back and, and was hanging out in Miami. And so he was hanging out there one of his first nights back from Belize. And, and in fact, he was evading um, uh, charges of, of murder of a neighbor in Belize. I don't know if you know that story as well, but crazy documentary about that. Anyways, Janice goes up to him. Is, is, is that? That's her. Really? <laughs> yeah. 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 How do they meet? <laughs> in Miami. She was a prostitute in Miami. And she approached his table and he goes, what, what can I do for you? And, and she said, uh, I'm here to rob you. And, uh, you know, and, and he was like, okay, at least I know, you know, if you just were honest with John McAfee, he could work with you, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so they, so he went to, a, he went to like a, was it a strip club or? It, no, he was out on the street in front of a cafe and Janice just walked straight up to him. But he was like really, really wealthy, right? Yeah. He's super wealthy. Yeah. Why, why didn't he just get a bunch of like hotties and like 25 of them. <laughs> I, well, he did that. You know, he used to pay Circus de, Le, uh, uh, Circus de Soleil, um, uh, you know, acrobatics and stuff. Uh, the, the females there, a lot of money to be with them and stuff. And he partied hard. This guy partied like no other. And I don't know what the connection w was with uh, him and Janice, but they they were in love and super loyal to each other. In fact, from what I saw. From my yeah, yeah. limited time with yeah. him, two years yeah. on the run with him and 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 running running with him for two years, pretty loyal. So so, talk to me about like what what happened like how did you both end up in trouble and and like what 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 went on? Well, okay, so so basically, uh, he started giving me more responsibility. I, f I first started out, I didn't know what crypto was. This is when Bitcoin was like four hundred bucks. Ethereum was really down. Everything was so new, you know. And so when I showed up to um, his plantation mansion, you know, all these, yeah. all these computers are up and screens are up and they're doing this candlestick, you know, it looked like stock trading, but it was crypto. And John McAfee started giving me more authority and, and more um, jobs and stuff. And so I started reading white papers. I started running the business in a lot of ways. I started running his Twitter account. He started telling me to pick out coins of the day, cryptocurrency coins of the day. And I started doing negotiations for him, lead lead executive advisor in negotiations, which was easy because his negotiations were non-negotiable, right? Well, I was doing this with success and he thought I was his uh, lucky charm. Mm. And it wasn't that I was his lucky charm. He was just so influential that whatever coin that I picked and he selected and, and mentioned on his 1 million follower Twitter account at the time, 75% of that Twitter following did exactly what he said instantaneously. So you can imagine the power there. If I pick this cryptocurrency coin and I mention it on Twitter, and then 75% of 1 million people instantaneously purchase that crypt, that, that coin, yeah. it shoots up. He's already invested in it. He obviously pulls out at, at the highest point. 
And of course, I wanted a part of that too after seeing it for some time going, what the heck am I doing? Why am I not doing this too? You know? So that's considered, um, at the time, at the time, you know, we were reassured by McAfee and everybody else. There's no rules to the crypto game. There's not, there's, there's nothing bad can happen to you, but hindsight 2020, it's insider trading. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen. But a majority of the business uh, was absolutely legit. Like the negotiations, the negotiations we were doing with ICOs and blockchain technology and companies. And basically they were paying John McAfee $100,000 for one tweet to tweet out their company. But we sent it through multiple auditing systems, right? To make sure it was a real company. And did we get it wrong? Yeah. Did we apologize for getting it wrong? If we did, and hopefully there wasn't investors in it at the time. Yeah. You know, so at the end of two years, John McAfee started bragging about not paying his taxes for, for, for six years. And John had a no bluff policy. Pretty much everything he said was true or it would come true. And, but, but when he said he was not paying his taxes to everybody on his Twitter account, I was like, dude, there's no freaking way he's admitting this. I guarantee he's paying his taxes. Well, guess what? They picked him up in Spain for tax evasion. They're basically the same thing as Capone. They couldn't get him on a lot of other things, so they get you for the tax evasion. Um, and they charged me with the exact same felonies as him. Conspiracy to commit fraud, um, money, wire la- uh, money wire fraud, um, money laundering. Um, and at the time you're doing that stuff, it's not called that in your head. You're like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll move this crypto to my personal checking account, liquidate it. You know, turn it into USD, move it to my account, and then move it to his trust fund. Well, because I was doing that, and that those funds or, originated from a scheme, what the SEC and CFTC would call a scheme, then now that money, any money that you transfer or do anything with, is considered or can be argumented in, in the courts as uh, money laundering yeah. and and all this stuff. So that's where me running the company because you were the CEO. I was the CEO. So with me running the company, that's that's what they- Why, why did he make you the CEO? Because the, 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 you you he hired you for protection and then you guys became friends and then he just said, yeah. well, you, you run the show? Yeah, he, yeah. I came in as just the bodyguard. Didn't know anything about crypto, but I was super efficient. You know, I came in with a clipboard. I said, hey, sir, what are we doing today? I was highly motivated, flexing to the next target, you know? And I had led teams before. I had a, I had a lot of success leading teams before. And I just took that same approach with John. And I remember uh, meeting him at coffee. And he was like, you're you're different than the others. You're different yeah, than yeah. them. And so he started tasking me. And every task I would take, I would, I would maximize that potential of that task, make it super efficient, find flaws, fix it show it to him, get suggestions. And he was like, Hey, Jimmy, you know, you're an, you know, you may not look like it, but you're an intellectual. He goes, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to promote you to this. And I promoted through the ranks from like his assistant to executive advisor to negotiate. So, so let's say when, when he hired you, he was paying you 500 bucks a, a, a day or, or, yeah. or a yeah. thousand a day or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're making anywhere from 15 grand a month to 30 grand a month. Yeah, fifteen grand a month for the first thirty days. Yep, and and, and then uh, when you became the CEO, uh, how much more were you making? Oh man, I I mean I went from f- the very first thirty days I made fifteen grand. This this within sixty days I was making about two Ethereum a day. He started paying me an Ethereum, which was seven hundred an Ethereum, so two Ethereum a day, you know, fourteen hundred a day. And then as CEO, I mean I was making millions. I mean I was making sometimes twenty five, twenty thousand dollars a day. How do you make 25 with the trades? Yeah, with the trades and with not just with the trades, but off of commission deals, you know. So so why why did he uh why would he pay you Ethereum? Is it kind of like to kind of like to not show cash transaction? No, like US dollars? not necessarily. He didn't mind dealing <laughs> with cash. We went to the bank all the time, got tons of cash out. In fact, he paid everybody in cash every Sunday. He would just dish it out, you know, dish. He had stacks and stacks and racks and racks of cash. How many people did he pay? How many people did he have? Seven people would line up like little chickens around him with their hands out. And he would walk around, you know, daddy big bucks. Was that that just like a bonus? That was their pay for the week. He paid everybody in cash. 
But then he then he just decided one day he said, "Hey, son, I want to pay you in Ethereum. Are you good with that?" And I was like, "Okay, what kind of catch is there to this?" Well, if the market was going up, you know, I was doing really well. So you go from like getting five hundred a day, seven hundred a day to two, three thousand a day. You yeah, know? yeah. So I like the Ethereum payment. Yeah. Do you still have Ethereum? I don't have Ethereum anymore. I don't have really any crypto anymore. I can still trade. There's no regulations against me like that. Um, I you, can't. You're good at trading. I, I was I was decent at trading. Of course, I had the eagle eye view of everything. And when you're at the top of your game, I was at the top of the top of the game in the crypto market in 2018 and 19. But when you have that bird's eye view, it's easy to make trades. It's easy to know what's going on. But when I, I no longer have that view, so I don't do stupid stuff. I don't invest my money like that. What, what do you mean by the view, the the bird side view? Well, well, you know, John McAfee was at the top of the crypto game. He had all the insider stuff. Oh, and because he would, and whatever he said, people would Whatever follow. he said went, you know? And one of the big things that John McAfee was in trouble for was that he wasn't mentioning that he was investing in those things. Mm. But his big argument was always like, does Michael Jordan uh, go on the commercial and say, I'm getting paid a million dollars to wear these Air Jordans right now? No. So why should I have to? Of course I'm invested yeah. in this. If I'm yeah. mentioning a co coin, of course I am. So John McAfee. So 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 what happened with John McAfee? He he ends up dead. He he's hung in in in, in prison. Yeah, they find and, John McAfee and, dead and, in prison. And you and you get out like like, yeah. and, and then you get you get dismissed. Like how 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 does all that work? Like how does all all that happen? Yeah. So I'm on house arrest for a year and a half, pending trial. Lawyers tell me I'm facing 15 years, all this crazy stuff. I'm basically a nervous wreck, you know, super depressed. How, how did my life go from retiring as a SEAL to now sitting on house arrest for a year and a half, pending all this time in prison? Life happens so fast at you. And I was super depressed, super anxious, uh, awaiting John McAfee to come back to the States and stand trial with me. Well, when they found him dead in, in prison, they decided to drop my case and dismiss my case they still find the the hell out of me with uh the sec and cftc civil charges i racked up quite a bit of fines with them but the criminal part was completely dismissed when they found him dead in the prison so my life pretty much you can, do you feel that's kind of like uh, a conspiracy conspiracy theory yeah yeah i think there's three options when it comes to, to it, seems, it seems like they wanted him dead yeah, I think so. I think John McAfee had, I mean, I lived with him for two years. And I mean, I watched him personally hand off what he told me was terabytes of information on government officials. Mm. I won't name the names here, but government officials. And those government officials, one, uh, a female that, that many, many people are aware of, um, uh, he had that information in a, in, in a manila envelope and we passed it off to two guys in Miami. And that later on, I heard everybody saying the dead man switch. If McAfee dies for some reason, all this information is going to get released. Well, why didn't it get released? Well, I mean, nobody's going to release that information if you've already been paid for it. They were already paid for it. So why would they risk releasing this information and, and getting it tracked back to them? That's one conspiracy. He could have killed himself. I highly, highly doubt that. I think he was probably killed for some reason. Um, or the he, third. He was 75 when he when he died? 30, 75, yeah. I think 75, yeah. And it was sad. He was like a father figure to me. It was serious, you know? He was like, he seems like a cool dad. He was cool. He was super cool. He was rough, though. He was kind of hands on. And he, he, and he was like strong at, at, at that age? He super was like a strong. Like a strong man? He was super strong. Yeah, because you know, you know, when when you're 75, uh, most most men are they get a little soft, a little weaker. Yeah, they, yeah. they they kind of hunch back a little bit. He he seems like he was a 70, no, he 74 was year old that nails. was like fucking tough and would scream at you and yeah. One time he slapped me in the face. Really, dude, I I was retired out of the military. You know, not the guy to mess with really, and you know, protecting him with his life, and he loved me for that. But I remember. Um, he slapped me so hard the, the the phone flew out of my hand, my hand in the bathroom on a cruise because I went up to him because these two Russian guys, you know, showed me their phone and said, "Hey, you want these girls in this yacht? 
when we when we go into port. They wanted to do a big business deal with me. And stupid me being novice at this business game, you know, but honest Abel over here. I take the I said, can I borrow this to the two Russians on this cruise? And they were like, sure. So I grabbed the phone. I went in the bathroom. I was like, sir, Mr. McAfee, check this out. I was like, these two Russians, you know, want me to meet these girls on this yacht and all this stuff. And, and about the time I was saying all that, John just slapped me and the phone flew out of my hand in the bathroom this Russian's phone. And he said, don't you ever, ever, ever mix all of this garbage with business again. Do you understand me? So I, I learned quick, you know what I mean? So I never did that again. Yeah. So, so, so when, when you get out, right. Uh, well, let, let's, let's go back to um, being a Navy SEAL. Yeah. So you, you, you come out and then that's when, when John McAfee hires you, but the Navy SEAL, like how many years were you there? Yeah. And, and how, how, because you said you wanted to be a, a Navy SEAL from a kid. Yeah, since you were a yeah. Kid. I wanted to be something like that. So, for my whole so life. once you once you become one, like how is it? I I I've been I've been to David Goggins' uh, place in New York. Yeah. In person, met him, him and his girl. Uh, yeah. I know I know Taylor. You yeah, know, Taylor. Yeah, friend. he's my man. I know Ray Cash. Ray he's Cash, like, cool. Yeah. So so I I know I I've met a. a Quite a few of, of Navy SEALs and and everybody is has the, the same type of energy. Yeah. Uh, so was it what you expected? Was it a dream come true? What, what was it hard? Was it scary? Uh, did you ever have any moments where you thought, man, uh, uh, did I do the right thing? Like like how how scary, fun, dangerous is is it? And how long were you there? What's that term? You know, you love the circus but not the clowns. Maybe it's the other way around. Yeah. But I, I love the SEALs. I love the team, the tribe, the warrior mentality, the brotherhood, you know, running and gunning. You work hard. You play super hard. You're jumping out of airplanes at four in the morning. You know, um, you're doing all kinds of cool stuff all the time. You know, you're, you're taking down ships, gas oil platforms, all this stuff, shooting all the time. And then you're going out and you're bonding. Uh, and so you make this massive connection. And plus you have that that camaraderie and then that esteem and you've earned, you're so proud of what you've earned. It's taking you so long. Yeah. And the attrition rate was terrible. So, you, you know, it's, it's taking you so long. I, I found myself depending on that title though, in living behind that. Mm -hmm. And so that made me um, seek validation from all the wrong person, place and things. And, uh, but it was everything that I expected and more, but I loved it so much that when I finally had to get out after eight years, um, I, I just was like devastated. Didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I had a major diving accident. You're going to get injured. You're going to get some broken bones. You could die. It's a dangerous job. You may not, you know, but some guys have great, beautiful careers and families, you know. Um, but I got out and didn't know what I was going to do. I was pretty lost because that transition for veterans is difficult. So so how was your regular Monday through Sunday? Did, is it is Monday through Friday different routine than Saturday and Sunday or is every day the same? Like like how go back and tell me like well what time were you waking up? What what was it what did they consist of and what day did you what time did you go to sleep? As an actual seal you're like you're like wait like I used to get up at like 3:30 in the morning meet the new guys, PT the hell out of the new guys, the new SEALs. And I would do the PT with them. It wasn't like the Marines were the haze and stuff. I would do this terrible PT with them, this physical training, right? Um, run, swim, run, all this smash, you know, monster mash sessions with them. And then take a shower, um, go get the morning brief. You may pack your shoot. You may jump the next day. You may be doing dive ops for 26 weeks straight and then go to a close quarter battle, you know, uh, uh, shooting all day long, a couple weeks of shooting with pistol, a couple weeks of shooting with rifle. And then, you know, you're going over the fundamentals all the time and then you're going clearing houses and stuff. And and then you 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 take that and you build and build and build and build, you know, over these weeks and months. And you're always doing a training block. We'd go up to Hunter Liggett and do um, long range patrols and IADs in the desert shooting or shooting next to each other and stuff um, and desert warfare training. And then the very next year, you you basically start all over. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you're a ninja warrior and you, you, you know, you just advance and advance and advance. And there's a time for that. But basically, it was amazing. You go right back to the fundamentals again because, you know, you, you're perishable skills because in the SEALs, you do so much. 
you have to be kind of a master at many things that, you know, you're always, you know, by the time you get done with a whole block of, of jumping and a whole block of CQB and a whole block of this and a whole block of that, now you need to go back to desert warfare training or you need to go back to jumping or you need to go back to dive ops and kind of cycle back. So you're always, you know, up on your game with that to not lose those those more perishable skills. Yeah. How, how many years were you there? Eight years. Yeah. Eight years. Yeah. yeah. And so does do you have a family, kids, girlfriend, wife? Oh, man, I have a beautiful uh, Russian wife I met in Spain while I was sailing over there on my sabbatical for a couple of years. Um, and I have a, of course, a beautiful eight, eight month old boy. Oh, really? Yeah. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. He's so cute. He's so cute. I mean, and it's, it's brought so much life and joy into yeah. my life, especially man coming from my background where, you know, I, I started to lose hope and I started to go in some very dark valleys in my life. Um, when I got out, of, when I got out of the seals. And so, so your, your wife, uh, your Russian wife, you met her when you were in, in Spain. Yeah. No, in Spain. I met her after McAfee. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen. When I was in Spain. Oh, when you got out of jail? Before I went to jail. Oh, before you went to jail. Yeah. Right after. When I went on, I, I basically went on the run and mm -hmm. I was overseas. Um and I just planned on living overseas the rest of my life. And, and you had good money. You were you were like cutting the money. Yeah, I had a lot of money, uh, plenty of money, and like I, millions of dollars. I, yeah, millions. I I had a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had millions, and, um, and not were, not tens of millions. Yeah, and and you were in. Uh, you, did, did you go to? Uh, and I had crypto too, brother. Mm. Yeah. Crypto. I heard you could kind of hide it, right? There, if if you know how to use it and play it. Well, you can't. You can't necessarily hide crypto. That was kind of a trick they used to say. It's untraceable. It's this and this. But honestly, you know, once they have your number, yeah. once they know your Ethereum address number, it's they. I mean, it's unbelievable how how well they can track you. They can track you to here to there, yeah. to there to there. You know. I always wanted to have like a well. I I did have a few Russians, but like, like but I I always wanted to have like. I, I was attracted to Russians because I used to like. Did you ever meet Anna Kornikova, the tennis player? No, no. But my but my wife's name is Anastasia. Yeah, that, that, that's eyes. a Russian name. Yeah, yeah. So like Kornikova, have, you know who she is, though, right? Yeah, the tennis player. Yeah. Of course, yeah, I never met her, but I used to have a crush on her. I'm like, damn, like like I I like the Russian chicks. So I always wanted to go to Moscow, Moscow, and and just see the, the meet some Russian chicks. They're so different. They have that. They you know my girl is also like kind of that mongolian look kind of to her yeah from kazakhstan and in, in mongolian empire you know so where she she looks a little bit asian she looks yeah but but no she's yeah. got the black hair the the siamese uh cat eyes yeah you know she's very russian but not yeah and then there's the russians that are like blue eyes and blonde hair blonde hair tall yeah she, my girl's more petite and so, yeah yeah so so and, and then and then russians are also kind of what i notice is they're kind of cold like they're they're not super cold not, not 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 very emotional very like just it's it's hard to get used to because in america you know americans they they like to put a lot of fluff hey bro what's going on yeah i'm doing great man everything's okay man when, when yeah. everything's really shitty yeah. but my but my girl is like they're like yet and da like yeah. yes no how was the food baby they're like not good. so good yeah whatever and, and, you're, and you're like that's yeah. it yeah. you know i paid all this money you know yeah yeah so, so when you were in the Navy SEAL for eight years, like, like, how is it though? Like, you are, are you working Saturdays and Sundays too? Like, what? When do you get to uh, go out on a date with a girl? When do you when when do you uh, get to go out and and party a little bit? Uh, does that is that gone or, or do you do you still have time to like have fun when when you're there? Yeah, you know, you don't like when you're training, you're training hard. Yeah, like sometimes you're doing iterations during the day. Then iterations at night for a couple weeks straight. But then you'll have like, okay, we there's Saturday, we're gonna have off. And instead of resting that day, the Party? whole team goes out and goes crazy and then comes back just slog tired, you know. So you're like in what city, for example, you and you go out where? Washington, oh. um, I mean, you can it's Vegas, you name it, like like all kinds of different so sometimes you are in Vegas? Yeah, there's been times where we we did training in Vegas. We did training all over Key West. 
Yeah. Man, Key West was the best. Oh, yeah. Did, did you go to Miami or, or stayed in Key West? Stayed in Key West, yeah. They have good spots right there? Well, I mean, you got to make do with what you, what you yeah, got, yeah. you know. But but yeah. they but every single time, my simple tune went everywhere, anywhere. We had 24 hours to party, and then everybody was getting secured. Everybody was going on lockdown because there would be two or three guys in the platoon that always messed it up for everybody else. Yeah. And so we would go all out the first night and tell everybody, don't get in trouble, bro. Just don't get in a fight with the bouncer. Don't get in trouble. But lo and behold, every single time, we, our chief, our platoon chief would just secure us. Say, sorry, guys, you can't go out. You can't prove yourself worthy to go out. Yeah. But, man, we do, we do long blocks of training, cold yeah. weather training, all kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when, like when you get out and, and then you start working for John McAfee and you're protecting him, did you ever have any, any scary moments where, where you had to jump in and, and save his life? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was a couple times with John McAfee. One, I, I remember one Russian guy just jumped up when he was keynote speaking and just ran at him. And I just drilled this guy. You know, you just throw your whole body into this guy. And um, I stopped him hardcore, you know. And the guy kind of flew back. He was drunk. You know, people were just fan crazy about John. And, but John loved that about me because he knew I was pretty rough with, 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 I, I mean, I could secure him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I never let anybody, anybody close to him. I mean, I was, uh, I was pretty hardcore about that because, you know, if I was, if somebody shook his hand and he didn't like it, it's a failure on me. Cause what if they had poison in their hand? What if they had something to, to, to um, take him out. They could, they could shake your hand and have poison in their hand? They, yeah, there's all kinds of things they could do, you know? Like McAfee was always talking about how the Russians could kill you like by putting a little tack in your shoe with poison on it. Your, what? Your, 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 your uh, toe, you know, gets pricked by it and it, it poisons you from that. There's all kinds of different – there's sprays and inhalants that they can spray. One I, heard, time, I heard you could put chlorine in water too and kill you. Really? That's crazy. There's like so many ways to kill people. Is it chlorine? And I mean, the chlorine's all up in that pool, anyways. A little bit, though. Very, very little. Oh, but, but, but you put enough. There's a lot of different ways. Yeah. There's some. There. Uh, there's some ways I can't even mention on this yeah. podcast because I don't want to give people ideas to use against me. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't send me in the mail or something. Just tell me after we finish. I get fan mail sometimes, you know, and I, I gotta, I gotta get a PO box or something. I gotta, can't be giving out my address, you know. Yeah. But. Another time, a guy at like three in the morning came up to John's house and was like, he, he looked like something off of The Simpsons, like Krusty the Clown. And he had these crazy red eyes, you know, bloodshot eyes with crazy hair. It was probably meth. Yeah, probably. And he was just banging on this glass window. Yeah. And the glass window was just just vexing like this. And and I'm standing there and my ex my ex-wife had happened to be there with my dog, Tookie, my chihuahua. And- He's banging on this window. And so I just, I immediately just draw down. I grab my, my pistol out, my side piece, and I walk over to, to the door that he's trying to get in because any harder, he's going to bust through it. And I tapped on the glass and I said, yo, I said, back up, back up. And he didn't back up and he was about to bust through that threshold and he'd already come through uh, uh, the first threshold. So that's like deadly force, man. And so I opened up the door and he tried to come through. And he was yelling and I just, I just drilled him. I took him and just launched him off this, these steps and he, and he hit the back of his head on the concrete uh, and he was pretty messed up. And the cops kind of questioned me, uh, you know, it was an excessive force, but I was like, look, man, I, I could have basically <coughs> taken his life for what he was trying to do. Um, but me having my experience and expertise knew better than that and knew that that wasn't the, the proper use of force. So, so he, he, you, you like picked him up and threw him and he hit himself. In I the can't bathroom. really remember what I did. I just opened the door and grabbed him and launched him. Yeah. And he just flew backwards off because it was well, why, several why, steps. Why, why not just shoot him? Like, cause, cause they, like if you try to wrestle with him, what, what if he stabs yeah. you or something? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't suggest what I did. What I, what I would suggest to maybe somebody without the experience that I had is to stay in your ground, you know, uh, castle up, just stand right there and, and, and draw down on him and point it right at his, you know, his dome. And and if he breaks that threshold, it's over, right? I mean, especially if you don't feel like you can mitigate the threat. For me, 
um, I knew that that would be excessive. And I knew that this guy didn't deserve to die. So, so, so you would say, uh, like when you, what you mean is you, you kind of get in position to shoot and you, and you, you kind of get down. Yeah. Well, no, if, 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 if he is, if he's trying to come through the door, I would stand my ground. I would just, I would stand and draw down on him and get a great stance, get it, get that great stance and punch out on him. And I'd start rolling that trigger. And, and right when he came through the door, you know, I might give him a couple, a, a good college try, they call it, you know, a good, you know, pause, pause for effect. But if he, if he was coming at me, you know, in, in a way where I felt like my life was in danger, like this guy, cause this guy was crazed out of his mind. And, uh, was he a, a big guy or a small guy? He was kind of smaller. <clears throat> and, and so for me, understanding that this guy didn't deserve to get drilled, but he did deserve to get launched off the, the steps, you know, because he was really trying to come in. My, my wife was there. Mm. And, and he was probably like on some meth or something. He was probably on something crazy, man. Because, you know, when they when they are under the They're influence, strong, yeah. they, like sometimes you shoot them and they keep walking because because yeah. they have they get that. Yep, exactly. Like like that that doesn't um, scare you. No, you you never get scared of uh, anybody that no tries to like. No, I, I have zero fear when it comes, and I'm not just saying that. I I have zero fear when it comes to protecting my life or protecting my family's life. Like yeah. I would, I'll drill somebody so quick it's not even funny. You know that that is a legitimate threat, and that's why I haven't done it in the civilian world. In 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 the executive protection aspect of things. Yeah. I haven't drilled anybody because, um, you know, most people are unaware of the threat of their life. They yeah, don't yeah. understand that they're about to die. So there's no need to escalate it to that unless he yeah. has. Now, if he had a knife or if he had a, we a weapon, a pistol, man, he's this close to getting it, you know, getting those shoestrings tied, you know, yeah. Tied. So I've been robbed four times. For, That's for, crazy. And, That's and, what you were so, saying. So that, can you can you play that video really quick? So while, while you put it on the on the on the screen over here, I'll, I'll kind of walk him through it. But uh, so you see the the video and and how they distract me, and it's here in this building, and I'm always part of my success has been kind of flashing and showing the lifestyle. Yeah, telling people right. like, hey, I'm successful. Yeah, right. Check out my Ferrari, my Rolls Royce, things like that. My, the watches. So they, they've they attempted four times to rob me. One, the first time they were successful. Uh, fortunately, nobody was at home, only my dog. And, and my dog is safe. Nothing happened to him. But they 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 locked my, my dog in. They, they closed the door. They broke into a window. They stole my safe. Dang. And I had a Rich, Richard meal, uh, Mexico watch. And then I had a I had like 40 cake in the in the safe and they took it. Four uh robbers, all max mask covered up. And then and then the second time, the second time they got me here outside of this my office. But the funny part is I don't know if if it if, if it could have been one of an employee that didn't like me that that kind of like gave all the intel. To those people yeah it's interesting you said the safe in your house with this specific watch and the in the specific money that sounds like they there's an insider that knows about that so yeah i think somebody that used to work for me yeah and and then the second time they knew that i wasn't going to use the normal elevator they knew that i was going to go in through the east elevator yeah so they and and, and they knew that i was going to park in front and yeah. they knew to distract me with a bike that pulled up pulled right in front of me and while these guys came in right at the same time as I'm walking to the elevator. Yeah. So, so, and, and they knew that watch was like a three, $400,000 watch at the time. And the watch they stole at when they broke into my house was also like a three, $400,000 watch. Yeah. So, so, so the fact that they, so I've seen this video, right. And, and the yeah. fact that they used the scooter, the bike to distract you. And then these two guys come in very calmly, collectively. They know exactly where you're going to be. They've seen you do this probably multiple times. Somehow they've been casing you. They saw the your Ferrari. They saw your, your nice watch. And most importantly, they saw you without protection. Mm -hmm. or, and, or they understood that you 
were not armed in a way. Yeah. They probably watched you very, very carefully. They may perhaps did a penetration test, mm -hmm. something that we do or I did in the Marine, uh, the, the mercenaries was, um, you know, you, you approach the guy that you're, your target, yeah. you know, you approach him maybe like two months ahead of time and you just go up and shake his hand or yeah. like take a picture with him or, or bump into him and see how yeah. close you can get. And often their bodyguards around them would just keep their hands in their pocket and just be like, and you'd be like, oh, excuse me. And so I just did a penetration test on you. I just, I just found everything I need to know about you. I saw your watch. I saw that I can actually touch you. I can actually touch you and your bodyguards don't do anything. That's a huge, huge sign for me that I can take advantage of that individual. So these guys came in, obviously, and they, they're drawn out, right? They have weapons, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so one had a, one pointed a gun here, another pointed a gun. They had a gun in front of me. And they didn't even know how to take the, the watch. It was a Patek Philippe uh, 5890. So I still have the papers. They right. just took the watch. And, and so, and, but, but they're going to sell it for a fraction of the price, get quick money. And, and so the thing is that I don't know if uh, they, could take, they could take the watch and, and still shoot me. Or, and some of, most of these guys, they don't even, they don't even, uh, they don't even shoot. Sometimes the, gu the guns don't even have bullets, right? And you see them, they're all covered up, face mask. And we have the, the bike that passes by and distracts me. And, and then the, and then they, it, it, was, it was so clean, like they knew exactly where I was, when I'm coming in. They know I'm going through this elevator. This is wild. And see, they're coming in. And, and then by the way they're walking, you know, like I. And there you are right here? Yeah. Coming through? Well, the security guard's not gonna do anything. What, what is he gonna do? Security guard ain't going to do nothing, it, especially it, it, when they, they act in violence like this. They're aggressive. So then what I was going to do, see, I, I run out. I was going to get in my car and follow them. But then I'm thinking, what if what if they pull a gun out from the car uh -huh. and start shooting? You could put the, the, spider the, the thing back. Yeah. And, and or. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213 277-6208, and let's make it happen. So if that's true, which it is, okay, they would have saw that I was with you and I would be walking ahead. In this situation, I'm walking around that corner. I'm pieing that corner. I'm going around that corner uh, in front of you. So in this situation, I would be between you and them if they ever even came in. But because I was with you all the time, kind of like Messi's, who's it, Messi, his yeah, bodyguard? Yeah. Uh, I, they, people aren't going to attack him because they know this guy's ultra aggressive. He's presenting this posture like you better not, met, you know, F around and find out. And so um, they would see me or see the executive guard around you, protection, and they're going to be like, there's no way I'm going to go up to this guy. He's too much of a hard target. I'm going to get killed. They're going to see that I'm armed. They're going to see that I'm, I'm not paranoid looking around for a fight but that I'm going to actually do something. <clears throat> now, let's say they are, they've, they've got the balls to do this. Let's say they do have, they are, they are that crazy. You see how they came around that corner and they drew their weapons kind of at the last minute, right? In yeah. the charge. Yeah. But the only thing that matters in this world when it comes to protecting or defending yourself on the street against in a real fight with a weapon is the hands. Whether it's an old lady, whether it's a huge gorilla looking dude, all, all I care about, I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you're mean mugging me, angry, drunk. All I care about is your hands. And so automatically, if I'm in front of you in this hallway, I'm watching these guys, their lower waist. I'm watching their hands. And as soon as they lunge forward, look, if I saw these guys come up, as soon as they lunge forward, as soon as they reach like this, it's game on. I'm touch point and I'm drawn out on these guys. Guaranteed, I'm going to be quicker than them. And uh, even if their weapons are already out, um, they are not going to take it to the level I'm so, willing so, to So, so, what, what if, what if when you take your gun out, you shoot one, but then the other one shoots you because it's two against one? So, so I, I find it that this is going to be their dilemma because if two of them are in the hall with hoodies on, and they are, and they've got the the they're lunging forward at me unfortunately for them they're both getting drilled lightning fast boom boom it's it's not i'm not even double tapping them it's just boom boom both of them i'm gonna drop both of them and explain that later and and when they have weapons on them like that i'm sorry 
But whether or not they're loaded or unloaded, they should have thought about that before coming down that hallway and meeting their maker, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. then again, also, they're, 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 not, they're definitely not Navy SEALs. Uh, they, they're not that professional in, in using guns. And, and yeah. second, um, having the, the mask, it, it, you can't see like 100%, right? You're, you're not like, it's not like, like being fully aware. Like the mask can get in, in the way or, or, or they're going to be slower. So like somebody like you, you'll be quick and you'll be just like, both of them are down. Yeah, 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 yeah. In but 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 now what happens though? If like because they kind of surprised me because it's a it's a turn, so like I they literally just walked right in front of my face, and and you saw me going back. So like when when somebody just all of a sudden jumps right in front of you, there is not a lot of space for you to you, you if you you could take your gun, but they're really close. It's a, it's well. Here's the thing: I don't necessarily have to draw my weapon all the way out to kill you. Yeah. All I have to do is is all I have to do is break it and then pop it like that. All I have to do is break it and pop like this. So I can basically put up my hand like this and and and, and hit and shoot at the same time with my weapon like this. I can shoot so close range like this, pop up like that, like pop up like that. Yeah. So pop up, right? I love doing that. Pop up. They're right here on you. Pop up. They they're both hurting. And it's gonna be so loud in that hallway, so devastating that they're gonna wish they never ever did that. And generally when that happens, if a guy goes down, his buddy is just like doing a backflip skedaddle out of there because he can't believe that a gun just exploded in his face that quick. Boom, boom. Um, but that's on your security. That's why you need highly, highly trained guys in, in a day like this. Uh, in an era that we are in right now, you need you can't just have Joe Smo protecting you as a, a um, because. Because when it really comes down to bullets flying, you want the guy that's going to stay there. And 90% of guys out there ain't going to be around when the bullets start flying. It's just a fact or when that or when that aggression happens. So if I'm guarding you, if I'm in front of you walking down that hallway and I see these two guys around the corner, I'm already punching forward. You see, I'm not retreating. I'm punching down the hallway at them. Uh, to close that. So I'm going to close the distance on them as they're closing in an ultra aggressive way, you know, because you got to be able to take it to from that that three to a 10 lightning fast. No hesitation whatsoever. Yeah. You know, wish I would have had you right, right there would have been a good. Uh, oh, man, I secretly wish I was there. You know, yeah. <laughs> I could have I could have literally <laughs> sold the watch. These are my dreams, man. I could have literally sold the watch and paid you. The, hey, brother, these are my dream. This is my dream come true, man, to do this kind of stuff. I like yeah. fantasize about this stuff. I'm like, okay. You, know, you wish I, it happens? Yeah, It'd yeah. It'd be fun. Yeah, I don't, I don't wish it would happen with my wife and in, in stuff. But but I'm always, you know, in, in, in my field, it's kind of it's kind of fun to think like, okay, if this dude does this, this is really important in, in, uh, to stay aware. You're, yeah. not, you're not paranoid. Uh, but, but on a patrol in the SEALs, every few steps, I'm saying, okay, if I get hit from the left, I'm going to do this. If what happens if this happens? What if I get shot right now? What am I going to do? Yeah. Like, do I do I know exactly where my blowout kit is? Do I know exactly? You know, I've I've rehearsed these things a million times over. So every step on the patrol, every when I'm driving, I'm like, I create distance all the time. I'm closing the distance, creating distance when I park. You know, you never want to close. You know, I'm I'm baffled at people who want to just park directly behind another car at a stop sign. If these two people get out and approach you. It's over because you have nowhere to go. There's no room to maneuver. You need to leave your room, your yourself space. So, so what's because a lot of them they they follow you, right? They follow you yeah. home, or they they follow where you're going, and then they'll park and block you. Yeah. So, so then when they come out, wh when is your wh when when are you like okay, I'm gonna shoot these fuckers? Uh, when because if they come out and they're not masked, then they're not a threat, right? Or they are. It doesn't matter. The mask doesn't matter to me. Um, ski mask doesn't matter. Uh, uh, a hockey mask, you know, doesn't so matter. If, if, if they just feel, if you feel threatened and they, and they block I mean, you and they, they're coming out your car, you're going you're gonna to shoot them? Obviously, if they have a mask on, it's going to be like huge, you Shoot them right huge, away. Yeah. It's going to be a red flag, right? But it's all about what's in their hands, okay? Now, if they run up and I would say use your vehicle as your weapon. So, like, I wouldn't necessarily, like, just draw down and do something crazy through my window and all this. But I would definitely be prepared to break contact and get out of there as fast as possible without touching them, without without there being a conflict. So, 
being being ready to punch through, you know, um, I mean, the only way to to get somebody off your your tail, even if somebody's chasing you, the only way if somebody's chasing you hardcore is to to slam on the brakes and, and make them ram into you. That's in a desperate, def- desperate situation. But what if they're driving the truck and you're driving like a Ferrari? Yeah, it's so that it's over. That it's over for your Ferrari, man. You can't do that. But the Ferrari is faster than that truck, so you're going to be able to yeah, get yeah. away. But man, people need to be aware and, and ready at all times to to get ultra aggressive. Not what, 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 where do you live? Miami. Yeah. Oh my. You're, oh, you live in Miami. I live in Miami. Yeah. Damn. I live in yeah Miami. I was going to say. If you're local here, like I, I, I want you to be part of the team. <laughs> I want to be part of the team, man. Yeah. Yeah, hit me up. Um, you know, who knows, man? Maybe California is next for me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Miami is has a lot more uh it's it's cooler right now. It's 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 better to be there. Yeah, it's nice there right now. Yeah. But man, they don't call it the Miami heat for nothing. It's hot there. Yeah, it, that's true. Like the weather here is perfect. It's it's just the the California is not being run correctly. So there's yeah. a lot of uh, bullshit going on here. Well, I mean, the fact that you're getting robbed multiple times in the last couple of years, this is crazy, man. Yeah. Well, and these well, guys after, are brazen. After this, then, because we moved from Beverly Hills to Bel Air, after this, they, they tried it again and again. But the, the, the first time I didn't have security, and and they they try to break in through through my my house right and and then the, the and then when that happened I hired full time security so then the second the second time in Bel Air house they got caught because security was there like and then what se, se, well security blocked them they couldn't leave uh, and and they were climbing like they were climbing the mountains over there in Bel Air and all that oh stuff my God. like forty police cars got there. It was like a big deal right there in in, in Bel Air, and 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 they got caught. They got caught. The, the 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 bad part about California is that they get out, they get out right away because they That's get a I misdemeanor heard, and they get out. It's it's, it's just they, they have stupid laws here, so you need uh, security here if Definitely you want to live security. here. Security, yeah, yeah. So so let, let's go back to the Navy SEAL. Like so so when you're when you're there, it, it's I I hear a lot of stories from people that have been part of like the Army, the Marines. You know, and they tell me things like, man, I see a lot of stuff in here uh, that uh, you wouldn't believe. Like, I know I, I have a lot of intel of what's really going on here and the, what the government's keeping away from us. Like, I see all these things that if you, I tell you, you wouldn't believe it. Is, is it true that being being in there, um, you see a lot of things that you can't talk about or, or things that are just top secret? Well, well, na- I, I think naturally in in the special operations community, whether you're a Green Beret, a team guy, uh, yeah. Marsoc, or whatever, you're you're going to be privy to a lot of confidential information. Would would that confidential information, if it was leaked, cause World War Three? No, because they are the enemy already knows anyways. But then there's times where you are, you know, read in to a soundproof room. You know, you're read in. They call it being read in, to where you're you're given a specific no joke target mission and you can never even allude to 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 telling anybody about that cuz that could cause major major issues. Yeah. So there's information that could cause major issues but they're very very uh they they compartmentalize that and only give it to people who need to know the information. Yeah. And sometimes your buddy may know a little bit more than you do. What 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 if you get drunk one time and you just spill out the beans? You know, you got to have way more professionalism and, and integrity uh. than that. I, I've never heard of that incident, right? I, I I can't imagine that happening. Yeah, yeah. Because even even if you're just blasted, wasted, I, I think that there's like this scary Kind of like the bro code. That. Yeah. 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 You don't break the bro code. The bro code. Yeah, I know about the bro code for sure. Yeah. So, so uh, do you believe in aliens that they exist or no? Aliens? I mean, I saw I I saw a Skinwalker. I, I'm I'm I uh, hey, yeah I, I'm I'm convinced I saw a what is it a Skinwalker? What is that in Valley Center, California? I had a I had Skinwalker. A, I had a, yeah look that up. I I had a nice look that up, man. It's a shapeshifter, right? Huh? Yeah. So so when I lived in Valley Center, I had like 15 acres in Valley Center, a nice, nice place right out of the military, I had this beautiful house. 
And little did I know it was on an Indian reservation that, you know, Indian reservation land. And there's a casino at the top of the hill. And it's a beautiful place. And I'm out there working out in the middle of the day. I mean, the sun was about to go down. And I'm running up this hill and I'm I'm walking down. I do my workout, do my man makers, run up this hill. And so I run up this hill a couple of times and come down. Nothing's up there. I run maybe the third time. I run up yeah. this hill. I'm all tired. And I stop at the top of this hill in Valley Center and I look and there's these heat waves across the ground. And I see this massive looking um, Doverman Pincher dog looking thing crouched down black. And But the heat waves are moving through it. But it's definitely a mass of some type of animal. And it has the the big ears standing up, kind of like horns looking things. And it looks like Batman crouched down. But the only thing that I could re- logically think was that is one big Doverman pincher. But whose is it, right? I had never seen another neighbor's dog or anything. And so I made myself kind of large. Like if you saw a bear, yeah. you'd be like, hey, hey, you know. And that's what I did. I said, hey, hey. And it stood up. And when it stood up, it, the heat waves were going through it, and it was kind of, and it kind of moved around, but it was still a form, and it was every bit as big as me, and it took a step forward, and as it took a step forward, I mean, I it was like a black shadow that took a step forward with the heat waves going through it, and I just turned around and hauled ass down that. I mean, I was like, all right, did I say I had no fear? Yeah, right. The skinwalker comes up to you, look like Batman. You better run, man. And so I, I I ran back down the hill and I never told nobody about it. And then about a year later, we heard that there was all kinds of skin skinwalkers or something like that sightings around that area. And uh, I don't know, man. It's definitely yeah. something weird, something super weird. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So so like uh, to close out here. <laughs> Have you ever been in a, have you ever been shot or, or been, been close to like death? You know, I, 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 I was doing three to eight missions a day in Baghdad, Iraq. It was my permanent address for almost four years. Yeah. Um, Afghanistan, I, I did multiple combat deployments in two different wars over 20, 20 plus years. I'll tell you, man, um, I probably was close to death on numerous occasions and either didn't know it or when I did know it, it was uh, too close for comfort. In fact, I was hit by a grenade shrapnel on my leg um, at one point playing hand grenade tennis with an enemy insurgent there in Baghdad, Iraq. And uh, but there was multiple close calls. But but for the grace of God, man, but for the grace of God, I I made it out alive. Yeah. Not a lot of guys didn't, man. A lot of guys got killed around me. A lot of guys got wounded. I saw a lot of devastation over there, and uh, so. You saw a lot of a lot of people get being killed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. How, how does it feel when when you have a like like when you kill an enemy versus when you get one of your best friends killed in front of you? Well, I mean, you know, there, you know, when you're when you're uh, emotionally attached to someone and you see them breathe their last breath, or you hold their hand as they're dying in in the hospital, you know, right after something happens, um, you you can't get that thought out of your head, you know, and it's, um, but it's a dog eat dog world. I never, I never looked at the enemy as this guy I wanted to kill and, and, and get revenge for my buddies and all this. I simply looked at it as a fair tennis match, a fair, a fair game. Uh, it was me against him, him against me. He looked at me like I was a, an enemy in his backyard. And basically I was. Yeah. Did, did you ever go in a, and deal with uh, like Osama bin Laden and, and with what happened over there? No, never, never. I wasn't on that raid. Never was part of that. Um, uh, never was part of any high profile, uh, high value target type raid. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So let, let, let's talk about what you do now. So, so now you yeah. you're you're uh you you told me because i i said hey man i want to i want to get you here full time and and protect my family and all that stuff and you said yeah man i'm down i'm down but <laughs> but i but i i asked you like hey are you do you still do that and you said well sometimes but i want to now 
uh, now I'm focused on on more of becoming that business uh, person and. I know that now you're 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 you have something new that that you're yeah, that yeah. you're um, helping people with. So can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely, man. I I got the Mighty Warrior Tribe now, and I really believe you know we there's the coaching which is awesome. You've got that. I mean, the mentorship programs. Mm-hmm. Mine is more like of a group setting. I really believe in the tribe aspect of things. Where and and I've got this Warrior Tribe where we got men coming, congregating from all around the nation, even Canada, Australia, and they're just hungry for more. And the stuff that I implement in these groups, the two calls that I do with these guys a week has been absolutely life-changing because you know the blueprint to break every chain of addiction or bad habit or to get you in shape or to get your mind right, that sealed yeah. mindset, is accountability, one word. It's accountability, accountability, accountability. And there's nothing, there's nothing that will hold you more accountable than 50 like-minded warriors yeah. that are showing up hungry for more every single time. In me leading the group, it keeps me accountable. It goes both ways. And we just drill that home. And I, I've had I've had testimony after testimony of life change and stuff going on in there. So I welcome, I welcome if anybody's listening right now and they want to come over to my platform and join and see what we're all about. Mm-hmm. It's from the head down to the toes, man. And, and what what are like the main topics and do you have like different prices for for the programs? Yeah, we have different we have different uh prices for everything. Uh you right do, now. You do one-on-one also? Yeah. Yeah, I do one-on-one and we do uh uh it, right now it's a one-time payment for 497. Somebody can literally pay 497 and get the life of the program, however long that lasts, you know, as long as I'm alive, you know, and I keep this going. So lifetime membership, 497, and you get 30, 40 SEAL mindset courses. Um, you get two calls from me from me a week. Um, and I really put all I have into the, these courses uh, and calls with the mm-hmm. guys. And I spend a lot of individual time too. Um, I obviously do a, a high ticket offer for coaching and mentorship, which every single one of my clients, once again, has uh, – has has walked it's not what happens inside the group that's so important it's what happens yeah. when they walk away. why why lifetime but what why, why not like monthly that way it never ends because lifetime it's kind of like too good of a deal lifetime right, is, is, good. is, is it gonna end is it gonna end one day oh it, you know everything ends you know but yeah. it's, it's basically and maybe there's a better way to word that but but it's basically lo- the life of the group however yeah. long that lasts yeah but the monthly we have a monthly subscription we mm. have a 97 dollar a month yeah, yeah. subscription which that's awesome for guys um and we've messed around with the price a little bit um it's gone from a thousand for life but, but we, we got the 50 percent off right now just trying to get guys to come yeah, in yeah, yeah. i'd rather have the masses come in yeah right and of course i do one-on-one yeah you know and, and then what 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 do like most let's say like your top clients what do they really hire you for what what do they want to learn the most from i you? man i think guys are dealing with all kinds of issues you know the three core desires of a man to go on an adventure to fight some type of battle it doesn't have to be a kinetic war but you're going to be fighting some type of battle you know on wall street and a lot of times it's the wrong battle right yeah and then to rescue that beauty it's all about having the right relationship in 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 understanding what her core desires are am i beautiful do you love me can i go on your adventure these type of things and so we really we 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 create an environment where Guys are getting this information and it's sticking. It's yeah. got to stick. And so I do a 10-minute challenge. Every single morning when the guys wake up, they barely glance at their phone and then they throw that sucker away. They throw it on the couch wherever they sit down in their isolation, in their meditation. They ask God to come in. They sit there in perfect silence for 10 minutes. Sun Tzu said, air the battle is won in the general's temple, meaning you better sit down first thing in the morning and strategize and yeah. get the strategy before you ever walk out that door. Yeah. And that that's that right there, that simple 10 minute challenge. Yeah. Guys have gotten downloads, man, all kinds of life changing stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So so before I'm gonna I'm gonna put all your information below yeah. and, and but but before that, uh really quick, just a, a a question about your routine today now. So so like I know in in when you were a Navy SEAL, it, it's it's a hard routine that you do. Like so now that you're out and you went through like you were facing 15 years of prison time and yep. you went through all that now now you're kind of like um getting more into like your 
your i guess your your later phase in life like look you're you're getting close to like hey i want to build this uh i want to retire one day or or have a have x amount of money take care of my family and so you're you're getting more into the business uh uh point investments and things like that so now that you're in this part of your life what what is your routine are you still hardcore uh with your routines because you're you're in really good shape so like what 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 does that look like i'm 43 years old and probably in in the best shape of my life more than when you were a seal? not that kind of shape i had a super high like fighting vo2 max in the, in the seals like a, what's your body fat percentage right now uh, my body fat percentage is what maybe like 10 percent, maybe yeah. maybe nine percent you have a lot of muscle mass i have a lot of muscle mass you know and i'm pretty lean right now of course i'm on a whole full stack i'm on my superhuman biogevity peptide protocol which i swear by it's like five different peptides trt i wake up 4 30 in the morning i do 100 man makers after my meditation after my prayer after i ask god to come in after i strategize i get my coffee my touch point coffee i go into my 100 man makers 100 burpees which ain't easy, you know, at 43s. I, I bust them out. I go hard. And that's round one. Round two is I do, um, you know, a lot of times a full body workout or some of my Frogman Warrior workouts, um, which are highly, highly effective, give you a super massive pump. Uh, and then I hard charge throughout the day, you know. A what? A hard charge throughout the day. What is a hard charge? You know, hard charge a Marine, you know, I was a Marine, remember? So yeah. like, yeah, I hard charge, basically like I attack the day, you know, mm, seize mm, the day, mm. you know, from the time I wake up, I work up, I wake up with intentionality and purpose. Uh, just like Marcus Aurelius said, he said, do everything with purpose. I try to remain present in the moment, you know? You think the way you do one thing is the way you do everything? Uh, I, th I think we need to keep our minds very, very flexible and open to yeah. change. And I, but I'm a man of routine. I like to so, order the so, same thing. So you said you, you uh, take TRT? Yeah, yeah. And is that, is that it or, or anything else? I take TRT and I do five different peptides. I do, I'm, I'm on the superhuman biogevity peptide protocol. That's what I call it. Hey, if anybody wants the best stack out there, hit me up. What I is, the pep, what is peptides? Peptides are basically amino um, acids, oh. but but it's highly advanced technology. They they've created these different chains and stuff. They got one for libido, anti aging, but like like C Max. You take C Max subcutaneous injections. I take it like routine, like clockwork. Yeah, in the morning, take that C Max. Forty minutes later, bro. All that mint, you know. I have mental. I have that uh, cognitive clarity back, like when I was young. That that fog goes away from my brain. I it also it, clear it, it also bump uh, boost your your sex drive, huh? Yeah, it does. It does, and it's and it's excellent with TRT. But then you have like CJC, which is just like HGH. It it it, it stimulates the pituitary gland at, at night, and then DSIP. You know, it just puts you in that REM cycle sleep. It's the first time I've had dreams in a long time. It's because mm. I'm going in that that that. How, how much sleep. do you weigh? I weigh two twenty five exactly. And you're like what, like six feet, six one, six almost one, six yeah, one. yeah, yeah. And and the 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 weight. So you do weights every day, or five I, times a week. I do a hundred man makers a day, mm -hmm. full body man makers every day, even Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I'll miss every once in a while because I got that eight month old boy mm. that keeps me just crazy yeah, yeah. busy. Um, but I try to do every day, and then I do about five workouts a week. So mm. I try. I, I take the weekends off of actually going to the gym and slinging weights around, heavy weights. So you do five days of weights. Yeah, and something I swear by, man, is is uh, I'll do a set of fifteen for biceps. Mm -hmm. You know, just curls. Yeah. Set of fifteen. Yeah. Because the only reps that matter, you trick your body. The only reps that matter are the are the are three and five reps. And so you know, your body doesn't know if you've done ten sets, twenty sets. All it matters is those last three to five reps. So what you do is you do 15 curls, burn those biceps out. Yeah. And then and then you put the weight down and then pick it up real quick and do three to five reps, put it down, pick it back up, three to five reps, three to five reps, three to five reps, you know, a total of 20. And man, you you will just blast your arms, blast your body. I mean, I'm 43. If I was a little younger, I'd probably blow up. And if I got on the juice, you know, I'd be huge. But yeah, I'm not on the juice. Yeah. That's good. And do you also do cardio or no cardio? Because the burpees are cardio, right? Those burpees are cardio, man. Yeah. If you, yeah, that's a twenty-minute workout. You know, 
A hundred burpees. A hundred double count. So, so I'll, I'll go down. I'll do two, two or three push-ups, and then kind of like, uh, like Wes Watson. Just like yeah, like Wes Watson. Uh, yeah. A lot of guys are doing them out there because they're effective. Yeah, you know, you, you start doing burpees, you're going to get cut up. Mm. You know, sounds good. Yeah. So, yeah. so thanks a lot, uh, Jimmy. And then if people want to get uh, more information, they want to follow you, they want to join your coaching program, uh, they want to know more about you, where's, I know your website, you want to share yeah. your website and, and yeah, uh, where to follow you. Yeah, triple www.jimmywatson.co, C-O. Uh, so no M, so no M, dot co. Dot co, jimmywatson.co, hit that and join my tribe right now. Or, you know, just come and follow me, man. I, I got some great content out there. I do stories every day. Would love to have you part of the, part of this amazing uh movement we got going on awesome brother well thanks for being brother on the show. thank you so much yeah. brother appreciate you thank you